Hey everybody, Charles from HumbleMechanic.com. Today I'm going to be taking your questions on Volkswagen keys, induction services, a new sponsor, and more. This is episode 78 of the Humble Mechanic Podcast. So before we get into the show, a couple of announcements. First off, I'd like to welcome a brand new sponsor to the show, CRP Automotive. So CRP Automotive owns companies like Rhine and Conti Tech, as well as Penison. They deal in a lot of OE equipment like timing belts with Conti Tech, as well as they make Volkswagen's factory DSG fluid. So it's really cool to have them as a resource for really in-depth technical fluid information. I actually got a question from someone a couple of days ago that I sent over to my contact at CRP to get a little bit more in-depth on his question. So what does it mean for you guys when I bring a new sponsor on? Well, this one's a big one because this one's allowing me to do all the remodeling of the garage, which is why we're in the, <laughs> in the house right now. So I'll be able to have better lighting, more electricity, and at some point I'll be able to have a lift in the garage, which means that I'll be able to do a lot more DIY videos that you guys have been asking me for. So uh, shout out to CRP Automotive. Thanks guys for sponsoring the show. I've also joined their innovation council as well. So I'll be able to keep you guys up to speed on what's happening in that world. Along the garage note, we're underway. All the electrical wiring is ran. We're gonna get sheetrock put in in about a week. After that, they'll come in and finish everything out and we'll be ready to go back in the garage with air conditioning, thank goodness. And I'll be able to start rocking and rolling on the DIY stuff out in the shop. All right, first one comes from Todd. It says, Charles, are you saying that if I need an additional key for my 2012 Beetle, I should suck it up and purchase it through the dealer? They want to charge $225 for the key and $120 for the programming. I found VW keys on eBay for $50. Bucks. From what you're saying, good luck with those keys and having them function properly. Any suggestions for having a functional key purchased and made for less? Um, Todd, good question. This is in reference to a, an article that I wrote a long time ago about why Volkswagen keys were so expensive. And it's really not just Volkswagen keys. This has become standard across the industry. As cars get more sophisticated, they put more security features on it. Volkswagen calls their system the immobilizer system, which basically means if the car doesn't see the properly programmed key, it won't start. Or in Volkswagen's case, it'll start and immediately shut back off. Unfortunately, I've had very bad experiences with non-factory keys, things ordered from eBay or cut from a local locksmith. I would say the majority of the time they don't work. Is it expensive? Heck yeah. Does it suck? Yeah, Todd, I'm sorry, it does suck. But unfortunately, that's the best, most affordable, long-term way to get a key. Now, there may be companies out there that do make keys and do a good job and they work, but from my experience, most of the time they don't go through. The bad part is, is let's say you buy a key off eBay, take it to the dealership to get programmed, they program the key and it doesn't work, you still have to pay the 120 bucks. Well, now you still have to buy a key from the dealership and get it programmed as well. Odds are they're gonna charge you again another $120 because they still had to spend all that time programming the keys. Really, the only way around it is to have the immobilizer completely defeated, which I do recommend in some cases, but on a 12 Beetle, you know, it's really up to you. Remember, if you defeat these immobilizer systems, you no longer have that security feature on your car. In addition to that, as cars get even more sophisticated, the 14s, the 15s, it's not just the keys that are tied into an immobilizer system. You have things like CarNet, which is basically OnStar for Volkswagen, that are also programmed similar to the immobilizer system. So you have to be careful on, you know, if you remove the immobilizer and wipe that out, what's that gonna do to some of the other systems? So good question, Todd. Unfortunately, yeah, you're just gonna probably be best to suck it up and, uh, and get your key from the dealership. Now, if you don't need a key to start the car and you just need to, let's say, unlock the car because you're worried about locking the keys in it, any old key will do. It doesn't have to be programmed. It just has to be cut to the car. All right, next up comes from Nick. It says, I've recently purchased a 2000 Beetle Turbo S 1.8T six speed from my neighbor. It has been well-maintained and I'm fairly familiar with the car's maintenance history. However, I've never owned a VW before and curious of things to look out for, specifically the Beetle and the 1.8 Turbo. I'm also slightly disappointed with the lack of information on the display in the instrument cluster and was wondering what I could suggest for good multifunction digital gauge display. Muscle cars have been my hobby for a long time and I'm excited to get this bug on the road as my new daily. Thanks for any help. Sorry for the long-winded question, Nick. All right, Nick. So first of all, the things that you're gonna wanna look for on a 1.8 turbo Beetle now that the car's 13 years old, 
odds are almost all the suspension bushings are gonna be worn. So you're gonna to wanna to go through, do control arm bushings, sway bar bushings, sway bar end links, strut mount bushings as well as bearings. And you've probably got rear axle bushings that are worn out as well. When it comes specific to the 1.8 turbo, on that Beetle, the big thing you need to make sure is the timing belt's been done. If it hasn't been done, don't drive it till that gets replaced. In addition to the timing belt, you also have oil leaks. Valve cover cam adjuster gaskets were notorious for leaking on that 1.8 turbo engine. So you probably wanna make sure that that's been replaced or just monitor it for leaks. The bad part about those leaking is it'll leak oil onto the coolant flange and that oil leak will then in turn create a coolant leak, which the coolant leak can be catastrophic and leave you stranded. So look out for leaks, pull the oil cap off and look down and make sure there's not a ton of carbon buildup in the valve cover area. Those were also good if they weren't properly maintained about building up carbon inside the engine. Other things you're gonna to wanna to take a close look at are all the rubber hoses. They're all specially form-fitted hoses that get saturated in oil, either from the inside or the outside, and they tend to crack as well. Engine coolant temperature sensors fail <laughs> and pretty regularly on that one. I did a video all about how those fail. I'll put a link in the show notes for you. But the big thing like any car is to make sure that your maintenance is up to speed and you don't have any fluid leaks. If the car runs good, then I say roll it. As far as gauges to monitor what's going on in your Beetle, it really depends on how you wanna set that up. If it were me, what I would probably wanna do is get a DLC connector and like a suction cup mount for my phone and put that on the windshield. That way you could just have your phone and monitor everything digitally, which is pretty cool. The blue driver that I reviewed not too terribly long ago will do some of that. You can always add individual gauges if that's something you're interested in. I know they make a gauge pod that sits, you know, if this is the steering wheel, it sits right on the steering column trim. It's a little small and it, you know, you definitely have to look down a little bit more than I would feel comfortable with in order to monitor it. So I think that's why a lot of people put the A-pillar gauges on, but it's not something that the Beetle's really built for. So again, if it were me, I would want mine digitally on my phone, suction cup to the windshield. So if any of you guys know of something that fits the Beetle very well to monitor those things, uh, go ahead and post it in the comments section for Nick. Good couple of questions, Nick. Good luck with your beetle and I uh, hope you get her on the road soon. All right, next up comes from Tito. He says, hey there, just wanted to start off by saying I love the show. Thanks, Tito, man. I appreciate that. I will be attending school in the fall for automotive. I'm kind of nervous being that I'm in my late 20s with two kids. It's a two-year program and my objective is to start working at a local VW dealership halfway through the schooling. Is this possible? Also curious how you got started at the dealership. Did you get right to work on cars or start with Service Express for a bit? Thanks in advance. Okay, so awesome, dude. Um, good luck to you in automotive school, man. Work your butt off, treat it like a full-time job. I think you'll do pretty well if you follow that advice. So is it possible for after about a year to get a job at the dealership? I would say absolutely. I would love to hire someone that is in an automotive program that has plans on working at a VW dealership when they're done and wants to come in and work really hard. The thing that I would be concerned about is availability. So if you go to school from seven to four, you know, the dealership's only open two hours after you would get off a of class. So that might be a concern. Obviously there's always a need for dealerships on Saturday that are open on the weekend. So that might be an option. So I would say absolutely, man, that's a possibility. It's really gonna depend all on what the local dealership thinks and your availability. As far as how I got started in the dealership, I went to UTI in 2002 or 2003 at that time, they had a manufacturer-specific program for Volkswagen. So I went to like a year of UTI, and then I forget, it was like 11 or 13 weeks of the Volkswagen Academy. Part of that Volkswagen training was almost guaranteed a job at the dealership. And there was a lot of criteria. You know, the dealership had to pay me a certain amount. They paid back some of my student loans. The program gave me a certain amount of tool allowance as well. So there was a lot of benefit to going through that program. And when I started, man, it was dive right in, here you go. Luckily, I had already had the experience, so I knew how Volkswagen scan tools work. I knew where to find things in the repair manual. So I learned a lot of those little tiny nuance things that you wouldn't necessarily be able to learn right away at the dealership. So that gave me a huge advantage going in from day one. And honestly, it was a great way to get into the dealership. So I'm very happy that I went that route. I didn't do Service Express at all. Part of that is because Volkswagen didn't really have a Service Express program at the time, or I would imagine I would have probably started there, absolutely. But good luck to you, man. I hope it works out and uh, go in there and kick butt and work hard. And uh, we, uh, we need as many good quality technicians as we can out there. All right, next up comes from Ryan. He says, I've been working in an automotive shop ever since I graduated high school and took automotive shop class where I learned a lot of stuff. I've always dreamed of becoming an automotive technician, either working at an independent shop or for a dealer. 
And so far, all I've done is basic loop stuff with very small to zero mechanical work. But I know that if given the chance, I could actually perform the repairs. Any advice on what I should do? Thanks in advance. Ryan. It's funny how these questions sort of come in because I just take them in the order that they go. So it's cool when they kind of line up like that. You have been doing basically oil changes and it seems like that's kind of where they've stopped you. Well, if you want to do more than that, do more than that. Now, that may take some sacrifice on your part. It may take coming in early, staying late, coming in on your day off, to work with one of the other guys in the shop and learn how to fix cars. Talk to your boss. Make sure that they know you want to come in and be a full-time technician. Your boss may just not know. He may think that you're cool being a lube tech and that's where you want to be, but obviously based on your email, you want to be more than that. So make sure that they know, but for lack of a better word, don't be an ass about it. Just make sure that they know that that is one of your goals as well. And when you're not doing anything, let's say you're, you have a lull in the schedule for the lube tech, jump in with another tech, help them out. You want them on your side. Because if they're on your side and they know, hey man, this guy Ryan's awesome, he's always helping me out, he's there for me when I need a hand, we should put him on the line or we should send him to training. Your boss is gonna listen to what the other techs say about you as well. So make sure that they're on your side when it comes to becoming a full-time line technician. Also understand, man, that that does just simply take time. We had a guy that you know wanted to be a line tech, wanted to be a line tech and wouldn't really do the extra work that it took and then quit because he was mad that he wasn't a line tech, but he had no training beyond just working in the Service Express and didn't do any of those things, come in early, stay late, jump in with other techs that I had talked about. And he was really mad that he couldn't just jump in and be a line tech. Well, one of the reasons that we didn't make that move is it would have been a suicide move for him. We would have put him in a spot that he wouldn't have succeeded in. He didn't know how to work flat rate. He only knew how to do a small amount of jobs oil changes, tire rotations, and light bulbs, basically air filters probably as well. So it's hard to put someone that has such limited skill and limited ability right on the line and expect them to be a full-time 100% do-it-all technician. At my shop, we don't have like a transmission guy and an engine guy and a service guy. Everybody does everything. So you do the job that you get, whether it's again, transmission, engine, doesn't really matter. And it wouldn't have been fair to put this guy in a position where he would know about 5% of the, the total amount of what the job required. Jump in where you can, learn where you can, show them that you can do it, ask if you can do these repairs with another technician's guidance, and I think you'll be just fine, man. So uh, good luck to you, Ryan. All right, I got time for one more. This one comes from D. It says, could I share my thoughts on induction system cleaning? There's so much misinformation and disinformation about what needs to be done, what is bogus, and what is a waste of time, etc. Awesome question. So. Induction services, for those that don't know, basically means that you're treating the airstream or the fuel stream of the engine. If you go to AutoZone and walk down the treatment aisle, you'll see 10 hundred billion different fuel system treatments, whether it's just in the tank or aerosol spray or both. There's so many of them. I've personally done some testing on some. The two I've done testing on is BG and TerraClean. TerraClean was a system that we tried to do on a direct injection Tiguan in order to cure cold start misfires. And this thing flat out was a joke. It was a fuel system treatment that put chemicals in the fuel and it was done with this big machine. It was like huge machine, right? So it did through the fuel system as well as a mister into the intake stream. Well, the mister into the intake stream didn't fit right. So it basically had a trickle down the intake manifold. And that was supposed to clean carbon off the valves. Well, basically think of taking like an eyedropper and dripping it into the intake manifold. It's not gonna clean anything. The fuel treatment may have done something, but it didn't do what it said it was gonna do. It didn't do anything for these cold start misfires. Now, as far as BG was very similar on the direct injection side. We tried a similar setup. It just really didn't work. When it comes to port injection, I actually have seen induction services work, specifically the BG one. This one I've done on my Passat where we hook it up through the fuel rail and you have a can that hangs on the hood. You basically run the vehicle off of this chemical that sprays it through the injector. It does clean the back of the valves in order to get any varnish off. And that works really well. I have seen that cure cold start misfires, but again, that's port injection only. I've never found one of these treatments to cure or help or even reduce carbon buildup on direct injection, whether it's sprayed through the intake stream 
or through the fuel stream. Now, I personally use 44K, a BG product, in my car. I won't say that it's really done anything. I use it just because it's there. So maybe I'll do some testing on the Tiguan in order to see if that makes any difference with fuel economy. It's tough to do with carbon buildup because that doesn't really impact carbon buildup. So it really all depends on your goal. What engine do we have? Do we have a direct injection engine? A fuel treatment may help clean the tips of the injectors as well as the piston crowns, but it's not gonna do anything for buildup on the valves. If we have a port injection, it can help clean the backs of the valves. And again, I have seen that cure cold start misfires with the BG product. For the most part, I think good quality fuel, good maintenance, as well as, you know, blowing the junk out, so to say, really do help. I have 140,000 miles on my Passat, Every day that I drive it, when I get on the highway on the way home, I put the pedal to the floor to merge on the highway at highway speed. It may not do anything in the world except make me feel better, but you know, it's, it's fun and it does make me feel better. So when it comes to the, you know, quote unquote snake oil type stuff, um, I'm usually really leery. I'll try it, especially if it's cheap. There is one thing from BG that I found actually does work, and that was a BG compression restorer. Basically, you put it in your engine oil, run your car for about 10 minutes before changing the oil. I did a compression test before doing this and after doing this, and I seen about a 5% increase in compression, as well as a reduction in loss of oil. So on my Passat, I would burn one and a half quarts every oil change, that went down to almost nothing. So that one I am pretty impressed with. I'll put a link in the show notes if you wanna check it out. The can's stupid cheap, it's like seven bucks or something like that. And again, it's hard to argue with doing a compression test before and after the treatment and seeing a five to six percent increase in compression. All right guys, I'm gonna wrap it up there. If you have any questions or comments, post it in the comments section below. Hey, if you like the video, throw it a thumbs up on YouTube. I always appreciate that. You can also subscribe on YouTube or on the blog at humblemechanic.com. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, the blog, and obviously here on YouTube. All right guys, thanks for watching and I will see you next time. Oh, and super shout out to CRP Automotive. Thank you guys for sponsoring today's show. I really appreciate it. I've been rocking this mug here on the desk for a while and uh, looking forward to some of the cool things that we're going to be able to do. And here of the day, Carolina Brewing Company's Hop Roar. It's their West Coast IPA. Probably one of my favorite beers that Carolina Brewing Company has done.